living history brick by brick. I'm your host, Rhiannon, and this is Libby. She's one of thousands of artifacts that we host here at the museum every year. But unlike many of our donations, her history is a little more cryptic. With an approvable tale from an old relic seller, we realize that Libby could have come from anywhere in history and anywhere in the country. Which made us wonder, if given a chance, what kind of stories could a brick tell us about the past? This month, Libby takes us across Lake Michigan to 1929 Chicago. The Roaring Twenties and Prohibition have come to the Windy City, and with it, the deadly glamour of Chicago's gangsters. But beneath the veneer of power and money was deadly violence that was about to come to head. And against an old brick wall, seven lives were ended, and with it, the age of gangsters. This is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It only took eight minutes for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre to take place, but it was built on the decades of blood feuds that defined gang life in Chicago since the 1850s. While most were little more than a loose federation of members with no order or discipline, other gangs were tight-knit groups led by visionary leaders who created modern organized crime. Straddling the legitimate and illegal worlds, many turned petty thievery into million-dollar ventures and their look reflected it as they wore the latest fashions, drove the newest cars, and spent money at the hottest spots in town. This new veneer turned fear into admiration, and admiration into power. It is in this world that two major players would rise to the top and battle for control of Chicago, Alphonse Capone and George Moran. The New York-born Capone is arguably the most famous of Chicago's gangsters. In his teens and early 20s, Capone ran with the powerful Five Points gang in Manhattan, showing propensity for business and leadership. His skills became so well-known that Chicago gangster Johnny Torrio invited the young Italian-American to the Windy City. Torrio was a high-ranking member of the Chicago outfit and became the head of the organization in 1920. The outfit focused on racketeering, bribery and corruption, extortion, loan sharking, and prostitution. Bootlegging was in the repertoire after the passing of Prohibition, becoming one of their most successful ventures. Across town, the Northside Gang was maturing as an organization, moving away from its youthful origins as a market street gang. Under the leadership of Dean O'Banion, they shifted towards illegal gambling, loan sharking, robbery, murder, and eventually bootlegging. While predominantly Irish, the gang's membership was of mixed ethnicities, allowing for O'Banion's protégés, the Franco-Canadian George Moran, and the Polish-American Jaime Weiss to easily slip into leadership positions. Moran's pre-Chicago existence in St. Paul, Minnesota included robbery, horse thieving, and murder, making him a natural fit to run the bootlegging production along with Weiss. And soon, the two led the Northsiders to complete domination over their competitors. In the years leading up to the massacre, both gangs attacked the other with vicious and sometimes deadly consequences. Torrio's murder of O'Banion in 1925 angered new boss Weiss, and first Capone and then Torrio were attacked. Neither died, but Torrio stepped down in handing leadership of the outfit to Capone. When the Northsiders killed and broke up the Gemma gang, Capone had opted not to help their affiliates, although it didn't stop Weiss from ordering a second hit on his rival. Capone survived and had Weiss killed in return, which raised Moran to the sole leader of the gang. War raged for the next three years, and after the death of two union leaders affiliated with Capone, the outfit was determined to end the Northsiders. There is no definitive reason as to why Moran and his men agreed to meet anyone at 2122 North Clark Street, but as members of the Detroit's Purple Gang were involved, it may have had something to do with bootlegging. Moran himself never made it to the garage, but one of his underlings, Albert Weincheck, arrived with the rest. Often mistaken for Moran due to their similar looks, it is believed his arrival triggered the shooting. By the time the shooters were done, six men were dead and one was dying. All worked for Moran, including the second in command, Peter Gusenberg. The lone survivor, Gusenberg's brother Frank, died only a few hours afterwards, refusing to say who killed him. The remaining victims included Albert Kalachek, Adam Heyer, Reinhardt Schwimmer, John May, and Weinschenk. For the next year, several suspects were named by the Chicago police before being dropped from contention. In December, the murder of St. Joseph, Michigan officer Charles Skelly led Berrien County officers to Burke Stevensville hideout. 
It was determined the two Tommy guns that had been in Burke's possession were used in the massacre, proving he was one of the shooters. Others, such as Frank Goitz, Gus Winkler, Tony Arcado, Robert Carey, Jack McGurn, Brian Bolton, and Jimmy Moran, were eventually named as shooters or co-conspirators years after the fact. There was no one ending for the men involved, however. Moran would die in 1957 from lung cancer while serving time for robbery, while Capone died of syphilis in his Miami home in 1947. Burke was eventually arrested and served time for the Skelly killing until his death in 1940 from a heart attack. McGurn was shot to death while bowling in 1936. And Arcado, like Turio before him, lived to be in his 80s and died a quiet death at home. While these men in 2122 North Clark Street have been lost to history, the fascination with gangsters never wavered, even in the immediate aftermath of the massacre. They are popular subjects found in museums, on TV and movie screens, and on our bookshelves. Despite their inglorious ends, the legacies of these men and the massacre remain untouched by time. The gangs of Chicago have always been defined by ethnic backgrounds, and today it's joined by racial lines as the city's population shifts in the 21st century. But the leaders of today's gangs, like Capone, Burke, or Moran, are lured by the same swan song of power and money in a world that denies them both. Whether today's gangs and wars take on the same glamour as the age of Capone, it is hard to say, but our fascination with gangs will certainly continue. We want to thank the Berrien County Sheriff's Office for allowing us to film this month's video with the very Tommy guns recovered from Frank Burke in 1929. And Libby invites you to join us next time as we head to 1911 New York City, where the fight for workers' rights receives a deadly boost. Thanks for watching.